Hey, Happy Friday and happy holidays if you celebrate. I am back in my childhood bedroom and it's time for a very traditional video. I think five years in a row now, I've done predictions at the end of the year. I'm gonna do the same now. I'll review first the predictions that I made last year and then I'll give you four new predictions for the next year. So welcome to the 2025 checkout. My first prediction last year was that humanoid robots will become much more of a thing this year, and I think they have. I specifically predicted that uh, they'll be used in a first major factory, and yes, they are. The figure robots, I think, are used by BMW, and also uh, Hyundai, I think, uses the uh, Boston Dynamics robots. Now, it's very hard to say how much they're used, and to what degree, and how often, uh, which process. These are like classified things. Uh, but but they're certainly saying that they're being used in factories now. And then the second thing that I predicted is that um, there'd be the first robots for home use. Uh, I said that they'd still be too expensive, too clunky, but that you'd be able to buy them. And I think that is very true as well. Uh, you can buy the Unitree robots from uh, the Chinese company Unitree. Um, and uh, I think those aren't even all that expensive. They're something like three or $4,000 for the cheapest ones. And people can buy them for their homes. And they're mostly just for fun. They're not particularly useful for now, uh, but they exist. And then of course, in the West, we got the Neo. Uh, now this one, technically my prediction was that it would be buyable. Technically, you can at least pre-order it. Uh, it hasn't actually shipped yet, but yes, I think this prediction is mostly a pass. Gets a green check from me. And then my next prediction is a bit less obvious. Uh, it is about smart glasses, and especially smart glasses with displays becoming a thing this year. I think uh, I've uh, more or less gotten this correctly. So I said that the Ray-Bans uh, with displays would launch in the second half of uh, 2025, which they did. Uh, so that was completely correct. Um, I said that Google would launch their smart glasses with a display in 2026. Uh, that I got completely correct again. Uh, I think it's going to launch in a month or two. They've already announced this, so this seems pretty official. Uh, the thing that I did not correct, get correct is the, the exact sales figures for the Meta Ray-Ban series. So I said that they would hit 10 million plus in lifetime sales uh, by the end of 2025. Uh, so for the whole Meta Ray-Ban series, right? Uh, I always like to be a little bit uh, out there with my predictions. I don't want to make safe bets because, you know, like everyone can say that it will, well, the, the obvious thing will happen. Uh, 10 million plus did not happen. So what we do know is that at the beginning of the year, um, they had already sold 2 million in lifetime sales. And then the company that actually makes the Ray-Bans, Essilor Luxottica, also said that they plan to make 10 million units yearly by 2026. So uh, theoretically, we're on the path to 10 million uh, lifetime sales. Um, I think if we had 2 million at the beginning of the year, and uh, that would mean we'd have to have 8 million sold this year, I think that's a little bit optimistic, but like, if we're gonna get to 10 million yearly next year, then we're not too far off. So I think this was uh, not completely correct, but mostly. Okay, my third prediction, which I got like half correct, is that Intel would continue to sink slowly. So it's hard to get an exact number, but on the Steam survey, we can see that at least with gamers, Intel has definitely continued to slowly decline versus AMD. And then on this graph that I found on Statista, we can see that the sales, at least up until Q3, have been uh, perhaps not a major decline, but uh, definitely trending uh, in the bottom area. I also specifically predicted that Intel 18A, their new manufacturing process, would fail to gain external clients which it has in 2025. Uh, now, it's a bit too early to say if it ever will, uh, but we just got a report from Reuters that said that Nvidia tried out 18A and they just walked back from it, so that's not a good sign. And my whole reason for thinking that it wouldn't gain external clients is that I think it can't have been a particularly good note if Pat Gelsinger was fired, because if it was good, and if it had the real potential to gain external clients, then they really shouldn't have fired the guy whose whole thing was making this happen. Uh, if that had been the case, then either the board had been like catastrophically incompetent, uh, or there had to be something about it that just wasn't that impressive. Intel's CFO actually said that the node was not uh, ready for prime time just yet. That said, uh, the company is at least bringing its own manufacturing back in house again. And if Panther Lake is anything to go by, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll probably see it uh, in a couple of months myself. Uh, but um, I've, the, the machines that I've tried with Panther Lake so far have been pretty, pretty nice. Uh, so at least they got that in house, but yeah, no external clients. Uh, we'll see how it goes for them for the next year. 
Next, I predicted that there'd be serious restructuring and reorientation at Intel. Duh, that happened very obviously, I think. The most prominent thing that happened is another thing that I also predicted very specifically, and which is, you know, I long said that I think Intel is kind of the Boeing of the chip industry. It is too big to fail. It is too nationally important for the US to fail. And so the government, if it fails, will just come in and swoop it in and, and save the company and just like force it to have orders from other chip companies. I think that is happening slowly now. Uh, a lot of companies have said that they're at least exploring bringing some manufacturing or packaging or something to Intel. So yeah, uh, the company was restructured to, well, I guess suit the needs of government customers and, and also uh, external customers like that. And now here's a prediction that I probably missed, but it's a little bit hard to say, and it is that Snapdragon PCs would gain a 5% market share within the PC market. And uh, it's a little bit hard to say what exactly they have or haven't gained because uh, the exact figures aren't quite out yet, uh, but yeah, it looks like that didn't really happen. So Qualcomm itself has claimed that it now owns 10% of US Windows PC retail market for devices priced $800 and above. That's a lot of classifiers. You know, it's like a market within a market within a market within a market within a market. Uh, so uh, I probably think they're pretty far away from a 5% overall market share. Um, but yeah, that was a miss. Uh, again, I like to give aggressive numbers just because I think I, if we don't, then they're, they're, there's nothing to predict. Uh, I do, do think that Snapdragon is like slowly gaining on um, on uh, Intel and AMD, uh, but yeah, not, not quite to the 5% mark. I also predicted, or, or more just hoped, that Intel would gain a 5% market share with GPUs, and that has not happened. Uh, the last numbers that I can find, uh, they're actually at around 1% market share, and so uh, yeah, uh, their GPUs have been pretty well received uh, in, by the media, at least, like people, people like them, people talk about them, but yeah, they have failed to gain a significant amount of market share there. Okay, so that's it for Intel. I think I got a mixed result here. I got the direction correct and the, the big picture correct, but the exact number is probably not. Uh, okay, let's move on to my fourth prediction of the year, and that is that silicon anode batteries would come to, I guess, two phones in the West by 2025. And I think this one I got completely wrong. So I guess my, that the first one would be the uh, Samsung Galaxy Z Fold 7, because it makes sense to put in a foldable, because uh, you want to have like the thin and light form factor, and also the volumes are not that high. So if you can't get too many of them, you want to do like a smaller test run, then you can do that in a foldable, but that didn't happen. And I also guess that there'd be a second phone uh, after it, and that didn't happen either. Uh, I mean, technically, you know, you could take phones like uh, Oppo and OnePlus, um, that have brought their silicon carbon batteries to, to markets outside of China as well, but that's not what I meant, right? Like I meant that some other, other phone uh, brand, so like the, the Koreans or the Americans or whoever would, would bring out a phone. So I, I think probably I'll consider this a fail. Okay, and now let's move on to my predictions for 2026. And again, as usual, I like to make predictions that are a little bit out there, like I know they're not all going to be correct because if I if they were, then uh, that means that I just wasn't bold enough in my predictions. I think so. Just think about these more as uh, like food for thought and something that uh, uh, can get us into a discussion rather than like like you know, exact precise things. Okay, my first prediction is for the iPhone Fold. So I'm pretty sure that it's going to come out in 2026. Uh, this is not much of a prediction on my part because it's already been rumored by many uh, outlets. But yeah, it's going to come out in 2026. Uh, but what my prediction is that it's going to cost $1,999. I think that's a very uh, nice number. I think it's very marketable. I think the first iPhone uh, 10 came out for $999. Uh, and I think like, there's a psychological barrier to going over 2000, but I, I can't see it going under 2000. So I think 1999 is what I'm guessing for. And I have three predictions for its feature set, right? Uh, other than the fact that I think it will be a book style fold. So like, it's gonna be like the fold and not like the flip. Um, so I have three predictions. The first one is that I think they really have a, a, an extremely good crease uh, that is going to be very hard to see. I think the best crease in the market so far, just because app, this is something that uh, a company like Apple would care a lot about. It is immediately obvious to me that whenever I give a phone, um, a foldable to regular people, especially iPhone users, the cre they, they really focus on the crease and they go like, mm, yeah, I'm not sure about that. That doesn't look like something that Apple would do. And, and indeed, like it's, I don't think it's actually like a thing that bothers me in, in real life, but it is something that for Apple's customers would be a sticking point. So I think I think they'll put a lot of engineering into this. I also think that this is the kind of thing that Apple is very good at. The second thing that I expect is that they'll have a creative case. Like I think this is something that people who don't own foldable phones don't really um, 
appreciate so much that the cases for foldables are so underwhelming. Like they either are way too bulky or they have too many moving parts or they don't protect all parts of the phone. Uh, and so I think this is also something that Apple likes to have like a flashy design for a, 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 some creative new way to come up with a way to protect your phone. Uh, I think this is a, a key strength of Apple. They have good industrial uh, and design and stuff. And I think they'll put a lot of efforts into this. And then the third one is that I think they have like a new gesture for kind of like multitasking and arranging windows. You know, on uh, foldable phones, you can kind of like swipe in with two fingers uh, or you can like kind of uh, push apps side to side and whatever to like make multitasking very cool. Uh, and I think Apple uh, will have some a new idea for how to multitask uh, on the, uh, the, the iPhone fold. Okay, my second prediction is that Qi2, AKA basically MagSafe will come to two new Android brands outside of the Pixel series. I don't know which brand exactly, because I think the perfect candidate for this would be nothing. They're kind of a techie brand, plus they also really want to stand out, right? They're a small brand, they need some publicity. Um, and so they could they could risk this and they could uh, uh, put it in. Uh, but um, yeah, they I don't know if you've seen it, they had a weird video where they actually said that uh, it was like way too expensive to implement and very complicated and whatever. And so that looked to me like the, the actual designers haven't really thought about this. So that gives me some pause. But they'll be my obvious candidate. Uh, and then uh, we'll see if that happens and uh, maybe some other brand will pick up the slack. And if you're wondering why the lighting keeps changing, I'm shooting this with a sunrise, <laughs> with a natural lighting of my window. And so I keep having to adjust my ISO levels as I go. Okay, my third prediction is that gaming on Linux will grow significantly. So I just made a whole big video about this on TechAltar. Uh, if you're interested in Linux gaming at all, I recommend that you watch that. It should be linked in the description. Um, and in that, I showed that the uh, on the Steam hardware survey, Linux went from 1.9% to 3.2% last year. Uh, so by actually this year. So that would be a gain of 1.3% uh, over 2025. That's uh, pretty big, but I expect that gain to actually uh, get even faster. Uh, I'd expect them to reach at least 5.5% by the end of 2026. So that would be a gain of 2.2% market share in one year. That'll be a lot. And the reason why I think this is realistic, or at least possible, uh, you know, again, I'm trying to be optimistic in, in my predictions, but um, the, the reason why I think uh, such a large gain would be possible is that there's new hardware coming out, right, in the form of the, the Steam machine and the, the, the VR headset from Steam. I think those are like more niche than the Steam Deck were, so like they're not going to be the volume driver, but that that's one uh, factor. But then I also uh, can really see that like the desktop adoption is starting to pick up, and I think there's a lot of users who are uh, desktop users who could, could be converted way more than their people who are uh, interested in, in the, having to buy extra hardware, I think. And there's still uh, something like 60 million Steam users who are still on Windows 10, who are going to have to give up Windows 10. Well, I guess most of them will have to give up Windows 10 next year. 60 million people, 29% of uh, users on Steam, if I remember correctly. Uh, so there's a lot of people. And I'm also thinking that the people who have held out on updating to Windows 11 so far are the people who are least likely to want to upgrade. So I think actually of those people who are still left, many will want to have an alternative and will want to go to Linux. So I think, you know, 5.5% will still not be the end of the world for, for Windows, but at that point, you're starting to have a real competitor with some real momentum. So yeah, I'm thinking 5.5% at the end of the year. And then one more thing that I'm predicting is that like as Linux gaming gains momentum, there'll be at least one gaming studio, one major gaming studio, whichever it is, that will change its uh, attitude on anti-cheat and will start supporting anti-cheat on Linux when they, they explicitly did not in the past. And so that will make like flip one major set of games over from not being playable on Linux to suddenly being playable. That is my guess for 2026. Okay, my fourth and last prediction of the year is that the European Union, Canada, Japan, Australia, etc., will start to switch more and more of their technologies away from American systems, especially for governments. And I think this is, used to be more of a hope than a prediction for me, but I'm more and more convinced that this is actually gonna start happening in 2026. 20, 20, 
I think many people thought that if you just wait and make deals with Trump, you can kind of normalize the relationship somehow. Uh, but that is not the case at all. Things are only getting worse for everyone else outside of the US. And so just this week, they said that they want Greenland again. They also banned multiple European Union citizens from entering the US uh, due to their online activities. And Trump also fired the, de the Democrats from the privacy oversight board. Uh, and that is the board that is responsible for making sure that you know we have these data sharing agreements between uh, the EU and the US. Uh, if you host your stuff on a US cloud server and it, it gets processed uh, over there, that, that, that your data is actually uh, private. It's, that has now become a very clearly very not bipartisan, very political organization. So like it is increasingly obvious that the stuff that you store on servers from US companies in the EU can definitely be read by the EU, the Americans and can be controlled by the Americans. Of course, they will want to exert pressure on this. Uh, uh, and so I think none of this is going away. It is only going to get worse. And it is only going to get worse because clearly, I think the attitude is that uh, uh, from the Trump administ administration is that countries that are uh, in, in their orbit, uh, they're not allies, they're vassals, right? You have the powerful state and then we like pay tribute to the, to, we as, like, as vassal states pay tribute to them and they get to set our policy agenda. They get to decide how we regulate ourselves and we, we should be policy takers, not policy makers. And so I don't think this is like an acceptable state of events uh, for, for most of these countries. Uh, and so there'll be uh, plenty of pushback, I think, in 2026. Um, I also think that one of the reasons why there will be real pushback is that politicians are starting to feel real personal consequences. So once you have like actual people that Trump doesn't like who are banned from the US, uh, that is a real personal consequence. Uh, and also, uh, I think, like politicians will start losing elections, uh, or at least they'll start feeling threatened uh, in their elections by the, the meddling from the US. And so once that happens, people will start to make actual policies uh, in, in this uh, area. Because, you know, if it's just national security that's interested, then maybe they're not that interested in changing things. But once it's their own personal lives, then maybe. And so my specific prediction is that at least one country, and I think it will be Denmark probably, uh, will have either specific laws that are passed, uh, or they'll have some other very clear concerted effort to move at least their government functions away from US clouds and US technologies. Um, I think passing laws will be a little bit difficult and there'll, there'll be some legal challenges, especially once you're in the EU, because you kind of have to have some like level of like open competition. Uh, unlike uh, the US, you know, you have like a, clear rules of laws. The president can't just like sign an executive order and then some things happen. You have to like have parliamentary debate and, and uh, check against EU law and whatever. So I don't know the exact mechanism that we'll have, but I think at least one country, and again, I think it will be Denmark for obvious reasons, because they want, don't want to lose uh, Greenland. Um, they'll have a clear policy decision that they have to move. And I think this uh, in the end will also be kind of a snowball effect because once once you have one thing moving then like it becomes significantly easier for the others to do as well unless it was a catastrophic failure but yeah that's my prediction uh for for eu tech and us tech so those are my predictions what do you think about them are they too optimistic too pessimistic something in between and before you go, annual subscriptions for Nebula are now 50% off for the month of December. So if you're watching this still in December, then now is your best time to actually get an annual subscription to Nebula using my link. That's what gets you the discount. So be sure to use that. And we have a ton of stuff for you to watch over the holidays, like the dinner plan that is a perfect holiday movie, and also my Nebula original series, Technorama, and many other things. This video isn't technically sponsored, but if you want to support me, you can do so on Nebula. That is a very effective way. Or I also have a Patreon, did you know? I have a Patreon. It's linked in the description as well. All right. Happy holidays. Happy Friday. And I'll see you next Friday. Bye.